thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for inviting me for uh, this presentation and uh, the real important topic that we will talk about throughout the day. Um, Actually, my presentation is a little bit overlapping with Dr. Uh, Faisal's uh, presentation, but to open a snap into talking into medical management, I have to go through these uh, particular aspects, but you have covered a good number of it. So this is the sequence that we will talk uh, or uh, will present. Uh, we'll give a brief background and we'll talk briefly about the etiology, a little bit of things that I would like to stress on before we go into the real problem which is postpartum hemorrhage and how to, to me, postpartum hemorrhage starts, medical management starts by preventing postpartum hemorrhage, and then we manage the postpartum hemorrhage once it's occurred, because most of cases of postpartum hemorrhage are really preventable. Then we'll talk about the team organization and system organization that may help in preventing and even managing postpartum hemorrhage when it occurs. So we all know that, as uh, Dr. Faisal said, that uh, PPH is a significant contributor to severe maternal mortality and mortality and morbidity. The major problem usually in low-income countries rather than in developed countries, but even in developed countries, it's one of the three major causes of maternal mortality throughout all the cases. Uh, along with embolism and hypertension. Uh, in WHO, it's mentioned that 25% of maternal mortalities across the world are related to uh, postpartum hemorrhage. However, in low-income countries, more than 90% of maternal mortalities are related to postpartum hemorrhage. And even one woman is dying across the world every four minutes because of postpartum hemorrhage. It is, it is a real health uh, problem partic uh, particularly for women. The more problem in ident is identifying postpartum hemorrhage. The real problem is to identify postpartum hemorrhage because in most of the cases the diagnosis is late and that's why whether medical or surgical intervention are usually late and after losing very uh, valuable time that can save the life of the mother and sometimes the baby. So the definitions, the definition of postpartum hemorrhage is a controversial. There is no definite uh, final definition because not all women enter labor in the same situation. Some of them will enter labor with medical problem. Some of them will enter, will start labor while their hemoglobin is too low. And you cannot compare a patient uh, starting labor with a hemoglobin of eight with, he with a patient who is starting labor with a hemoglobin of 13 when they both you lose 500 or 1,000 ml. And that's why in the new classification, they have introduced a clinical situation of the patient at uh, the time of uh, bleeding. So blood uh, loss, yes, but together with um, and the criteria that was mentioned by Dr. Faisal, pulse and respiratory rate and other clinical uh, findings, because these Acc um, accumulative information are a guide for the physician to start transfusion and to initiate certain action regarding the postpartum hemorrhage and not only uh, confining the diagnosis with 500 or 1,000 or whatever. So the problem is identifying patients at risk and start the management, whether medical or surgical, timely based on the initial risk that has been identified for these patients. The most important, as Dr. Faisal mentioned, is primary because usually patients who develop severe morbidity and mortality, they do develop primary postpartum hemorrhage and the major cause of postpartum hemorrhage, primary postpartum hemorrhage is usually uterine etony along with the other reasons of postpartum hemorrhage. Risk factors are not all the same. And that's why when we look into a patient with risk factor for postpartum hemorrhage, we have to keep in mind that there are certain risks that carries more morbidity and more morbidity and more likelihood that this patient will develop postpartum hemorrhage. And this is part of the medical management of postpartum hemorrhage because identifying the risk and keeping the patient with special preparation and special circumstances and special attention is really something important to keep her 
to keep everybody alert in identifying that uh, postpartum hemorrhage early. For example, retained uh, placenta uh, carries 3.5 time risk for the patient to develop postpartum hemorrhage compared, for example, with augmentation by oxytocin or uh, induction of labor that carries 1.5 increased risk uh, for developing postpartum hemorrhage. There are so many classification in identifying risk and in preparation of patients for management of postpartum hemorrhage. One of them is the 40s, uh, where patients has been identified or classified in three main categories. The first one, this patient has to be managed in a consultant-based uh, center, and uh, th those patients were identified to have a suspected proven placental abruption or known case of placenta previa multiple pregnancy, multiple pregnancy or preeclampsia because the risk of developing postpartum hemorrhage is as high as 13 times compared with normal population delivering patients. The second category, they need really a special attention and discussing the setting of their deliveries, and these are previous history of PPH, ethnicity, obesity, anemia, and the lower risk where the, that risk that occurs during labor, and those patients carry a risk of four times to two times of developing postpartum hemorrhage. So looking into this classification and looking into our patients uh, is really important. There are so many uh, types of to classify our patients, and even there are instruments or tools to classify our patients during labor into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And while uh, low risk can be uh, attended by, um, for example, midwives or uh, um, um, take lesser attention from the uh, on-call obstetricians, the high risk needs really a very high attention and a preparation. So if we identify those patients and classify them, so we are managing them from the start by cross-matching and preparing and uh, looking into their hemoglobins and uh, sort of things. In a study that was done in our institution, postpartum hemorrhage uh, incidence was about one 0.6 per 100,000 women per year. And this is off the very low uh, incidences of postpartum hemorrhage. The risk factors that has been identified in our institution were patient's parity, uh, preeclampsia, previous history of antepartum hemorrhage, uh, the presence of uh, antepartum hemorrhage, multiple pregnancy, and CTGs, uh, CTG abnormality, and the uh, uh, obstetric uh, interventions that are related to CTG's abnormalities. So as we've said, the problem is to, est to estimate accurately the blood loss. Whatever is, well, what is happening, and this is not something related purely to obstetric, it's all over. Uh, physicians, uh, tents, and even anesthetists and nursing they tend to underestimate the blood loss, and this underestimation internationally is known to be between 30 to 50 percent when they visually assess uh, the uh, blood loss. Using objective method, like testing the hematocrit before delivery and after delivery, it is something objective, but do we have time during postpartum hemorrhage to wait for hematocrit level? Definitely not. So we can diagnose that retrospectively, but it's not really a help in our initiation of management and introduction of medication, and even sometimes reaching to push the patient into OR for surgical intervention. So um, the other problem, as I have said, that the patients enter labor with different capacity to cope with uh, blood loss, and this is really something that we have to identify from the beginning. And as we've said, the accurate definition of uh, postpartum hemorrhage is not really concluded. The problem also is that most patients with postpartum hemorrhage uh, that have ended in maternal mortality and morbidity are really preventable. And most of them, they are due to late diagnosis, inappropriate management or maybe inappropriate resources that led to inappropriate management and lack of available management system. 
and therefore, or maybe all of these uh, things together. And therefore, if we arrange a system and if we arrange adequate manpower and resources in areas where patients are delivering, then we start by what is called prevention. So we have to prevent because most of the cases of maternal mortalities are really preventable. <coughs> And to start with the prevention, it's very simple. Active management, apart from the system preparation that we will talk about at the end, active management of third stage of labor is really known uh, way of preventing postpartum hemorrhage effectively. And it, it depends on uterotonic administration of uh, after all birth, uh, gentle contraction and uterine massaging if we suspect that the patient might go into atony or if she is high risk for postpartum hemorrhage. And just that simple process have reduced, uh, uh, for, for doing that simple process, you need to treat 12 patients to reduce a blood loss of 500, which is the definition of postpartum hemorrhage, the known, international known one. You need to treat 55 of them to, to, to prevent a bleeding of 1,000 ml, and you need to treat uh, 27 to prevent uh, uh, an occurrence of hemoglobin of less than 9. You need to treat 67 to prevent an occurrence of blood transfusion, and you need to, to treat only 7 to, uh, to, prevent the, uh, uh, to, uh, to prevent the use of therapeutic uterotonics, the different uterotonics that we are using. So it's something really effective, really simple, and really easy to teach, even for juniors in, in labor and delivery. Uh, the WHO recommendation, I lost here some markers, I don't know why, but the WHO recommendation for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage, it characterizes the steps that needs to be done. It focuses on the use on uh, oxytocin for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage of 10 international units, whether IV or IM. And that oxytocin, if it is not available or if the patient in an area where no IV access is easy, can be replaced by an oral or rectal uh, introduction of mesoprostol. So you can uh, go into the second line of uh, interventions. Control cord detraction is really recommended, even during cesarean section. And um, late cord clamping is really um, um, uh, re uh, recognized as a uh, reasonable way of, of it's here of managing, uh, preventing postpartum hemorrhage. As well as sustained uterine massaging and uh, checking the tone of the uterus to prevent the occurrence or to avoid delay in the diagnosis of postpartum hemorrhage. So the management, as we've said, is, starts by early identification of postpartum hemorrhage. There is no way, uh, no ideal way of uh, early identification of postpartum hemorrhage unless we anticipate that postpartum hemorrhage might happen to any delivering patient, especially for those high risk. The ideal way of estimation of postpartum blood loss should be accurate, practical, consistent, readily communicated, and easily incorporated in labor and delivery protocols. But the most common and a practical way of testing postpartum or estimation postpartum hemorrhage is visual estimation. The other methods like gravimetric estimation, photometry, hematocrit before and after delivery and others are not really practical. So if we go to the criteria before and return to the visual estimation of postpartum blood loss, we find that postpartum uh, visual estimation of postpartum blood loss is practical readily communicated and easily incorporated, but actually it's not accurate and it's not consistent because I can estimate 500, you can estimate 300, and she can estimate 700. And we are in the same setup, in the same training. That's regardless our training, regardless our background, and regardless our experience, length of experience. We all, if we did not put in mind certain type of education about estimation of blood loss, we will estimate wrongly. 
So we have done this test in our institution and we have uh, compared the gravimetric with a visual estimation of postpartum blood loss and even we compared it with pre and post hemoglobin level. And we have uh, reached the conclusion that every healthcare provider that are dealing with patients during labor starting from nursing, nurse ending by anesthesia consultants are underestimating. And this underestimation was an average of 30%. So we were underestimating by 30%. We looked into the how this can be overcome, uh, and it appears that education for healthcare provider during labor do um, help in uh, reducing the uh, error in postpartum uh, visual estimation, uh, postpartum blood loss internationally. When we did the effort, uh, in educating all healthcare providers that have, were sharing with us this uh, test, we noticed that, uh, uh, and, and we, do, we did use a simulation for that, for um, uh, very little blood loss, uh, mild, moderate, and severe excessive blood loss. We noticed the following. Initially, and that's an international, and you can, you can reflect this on all international figures because they are similar. Initially, there was very significant underestimation of postpartum hemorrhage, and that underestimation was higher the more the blood loss is. So the more patient, the, the, the more uh, the, this patient is in real risk of uh, losing, um, of to be exposed to significant mortality and morbidity, I mean morbidities and mortality, the uh, healthcare providers were underestimating uh, estimating the amount. Now, after uh, uh, presenting an educational sessions for uh, the healthcare provider, that underestimation has uh, improved significantly, but yet they continue to underestimate. If we go further and say, why not to give them uh, the patient's condition, the vital signs and pulse and all the situation of the patient. So maybe that will help in improving their uh, performance. Actually, when this happened, there was marginal improvement, but did not improve significantly. So the major thing is to estimate visually, regardless. Uh, But there's, so far, there is nothing in the literature that will say that acute uh, or correct estimation or the effect of education and reducing the error in postpartum visual estimation of blood loss is going to improve on fetal and maternal outcome. Nothing to my information has been published, particularly on this. We have unpublished data that have proven that uh, maternal outcome, the hemoglobin difference before and after, has improved significantly, and the fetal outcome first minute APGAR score has improved significantly when we implement uh, education for um, uh, uh, visual estimation of, of postpartum hemorrhage and uh, uh, implemented properly during uh, labor room setup. So starting from prevention and early identification of uh, patients with postpartum hemorrhage, we go into medical management. Actually, the first thing is to early detect, and then, uh, as uh, Dr. Faisal Safi has mentioned, multidisciplinary approach uh, that aims to maintain the patient hemodynamically stable and identify and treating the cause. If the cause is not surgical, then the cause should be started by treating it medical, and we usually escalate the method of management of postpartum hemorrhage gradually until we reach the final uh, resource or uh, taking the patient to OR for uh, surgical intervention or even hysterectomy. But to do this in an organized way and without panicking, we need availability of comprehensive plan for the management of obstetric hemorrhage in the institute where the patient is delivering and providers should be familiar with that algorithm. So it's not enough that the institute will have it. The provider should be familiar with that, and a proper education or regular education should be provided 
for the health care providers in labor and delivery about the presence of this algorithm, and that one should be based on the resources that are available in the institute or the hospital where the patient is delivering. So what fits with certain institute, not necessary to fit sequence-wise and the availability of medication. The first resource is usually uterotonic because most of cases of postpartum primary postpartum hemorrhage are related to uterine atony, 70 to 80 percent of them. And as we've said, uh, or Dr. Faisal was also mentioned, we have to empty the bladder, massage the uterus, give uterotonic, and usually we start with, with oxytocin. But we go into the second line uterotonics gradually, and there is no literature that proved that one of them is priority to the other, so the sequence of the next uterotonic, if oxytocin did not work, it doesn't matter. It depends on your training availability and the facility that you are uh, dealing with. So you can go with uh, methyl ergometrine, you can go with F2, uh, prostaglandin F2 alpha, mesoprostol, and the sequence of these is not necessary to be uh, equal across. Tranexamic acid is also out of the medication that can be used to manage medically postpartum hemorrhage. It's an, an anti-fibrinolytic agent that has a modest effect on the prophylaxis and treatment of PPH, but literature has shown that use of tranexamic acid has, is better than placebo in reducing maternal mortality resulting from PPH. Risk of thrombosis resulting from uh, tranexamic acid is not considered during uh, the use for postpartum hemorrhage, and they did not detect that it has increased the risk of uh, thrombosis. So it can be used, but it should be used within the first three hours of postpartum hemorrhage. So if you are planning to use it, use it. Carbitocin, it's an agent, uh, at, uh, it's an agonist at peripheral oxytocin receptors mainly used for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage in cesarean section cases. There is no strong data that proves that it is a good med medication to be used for management of postpartum hemorrhage. Tamponade, regardless the method of tamponade, it can be used meanwhile you are preparing either for medical or surgical intervention of postpartum hemorrhage, and I will leave this to the surgical side of the management. But non-pneumatic anti-shock garments are really uh, 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 an instrument that can, it's, a, it's a, something that the patient will wear in her lower half. It will give a pressure in a way that it will uh, uh, re uh, reduce the, um, or reflect the blood that is remaining in the patient's circulation into the, its vital organs, mainly the brain. And that will uh, delay the occurrence of the shock and will give further time for the um, uh, providers to uh, start manage, managing the patient. So uh, it uh, restored the woman uh, consciousness, pulse and blood pressure, and decreased bleeding from the part compressed under it. And actually combined analysis of 1,442 uh, uh, negative outcomes were significantly reduced. Uh, combined analysis of uh, 1,442 patients, it was found that negative outcomes were significantly reduced and negative outcomes meant by severe mortality, severe morbidity and mortality. So maternal mortality decreased by about 44% and severe morbidity was reduced by about 80%. Emergency hysterectomy was reduced by about 56% and number needed to treat to prevent either mortality or severe mort morbidity was 18. So it's an instrument, easy to be used. I don't think it's costly and it's something that can give time before the patient will go into shock, will give time to prepare the patient, especially in areas with low resources or if the patient requires transfer. There is a full lecture on uterine artery embolization, transfusion and massive obstetric hemorrhage. Actually, the main thing in postpartum hemorrhage is to keep the patient with adequate uh, circulation, 
and uh, uh, oxygen carrying capacity. So there will be no loss of oxygen or redu reduction of oxygen into her vital organs or le uh, low circulation into vital organ and we end by multiple organic failure even if we survive with the uterus or whatever. So uh, transfusion, um, usually in massive uh, postpartum hemorrhage, we go into massive obstetric hemorrhage, and usually our anesthetists are the key people in doing that. Um, actually, a massive obstetric hemorrhage should be part of comprehensive management plan. So when we put a plan on how to manage postpartum hemorrhage, the, the, uh, how to organize the massive uh, um, transfusion should be there. And we have to be very careful to low uh, fibrinogen uh, that should be anticipated in a setting, especially with a placental abrupt show and amniotic fluid embolism and uh, early uh, use of cryoprecipitate factor. Other methods like cell uh, salvages, usually this method, you need to know that you are going into a case of postpartum hemorrhage because some of our postpartum hemorrhage are unpredictable, so this is rarely used in obstetrics. Uh, prothrombin complex uh, concentration and fibrinogen concentration, data regarding the use of them uh, in the setting of PPH uh, and disseminated intravascular coagulation are limited. Recombinant factor seven, we rarely use it in postpartum hemorrhage, but sometimes we opt for that. Um, usually the role of uh, recombinant factor seven in primary PPH is controversial. It significantly improved hemostasis in PPH, but also may result in life-threatening thrombosis in two to 9% of the cases. So it has to be used with caution, and usually in our institution we consult with hematologists. So hematologists should be with us online when we, start, when we decide to use uh, recombinant factor seven for, uh, for cases of postpartum hemorrhage. Actually, the most important thing is to have a system, to have a system where you organize your work and you have a logarithm of how to do and whom to call and what to call at what time. So uh, health facilities delivering maternity services should adopt a formal protocol for the prevention and, and treatment of postpartum hemorrhage in the presence of multidisciplinary team that is well-trained for the management of postpartum hemorrhage. Confidential inquiries have highlighted the that lack of communication and teamwork are leading cause of maternal mortality, even in developed countries. So in developed countries where all the resources are there, the reason usually is lack of communication and teamwork if maternal mortality occurred because of postpartum hemorrhage. Not only this, skilled birth attendant at delivery and health uh, expenditure are a key variables that predict maternal mortality at a national level. So the presence of facility, team, and skills are really important to maintain a patient's life when she developed postpartum hemorrhage. So we do have, we, we should have a system. What happens in most of the institutions all over the world, on-call team, they are faced with postpartum hemorrhage, they react to postpartum hemorrhage, and then, based on what they are facing, they will start calling. I need a urologist, I need a hematologist, call blood bank, we have massive transfusion and sort of things. And it's the same team that is managing every, all the patients will be managing that catastrophic case. This is time consuming and may contribute to patients' morbidity and mortality. So what is the solution? In medicine and the medical side of practice, they have created what is called medical emergency team. So medical emergency team is a system that is, has, was introduced to treat patients at risk, suffering from adverse hospital events. The survival of those patients are usually determined with a cardiac attack or whatever other um, reason, is usually determined by several factors, especially early recognition and prompt appropriate treatment. So if this happened, that will decrease the mortality and morbidity of those patients. And delayed activation of medical emergency team for those medical patients 
is usually associated with incre increased risk of death or severe morbidities. Reflecting this on obstetrics, so, uh, or um, in, 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 if we say that medical emergency team, you, can, you cannot have all the specialties are there, but rapid response team model consists of lower level of categories who can ramp, ramp up the response to include additional responses if needed. So we have now two types of emergency teams, medical emergency team and rapid response team. Medical emergency team, everybody has to come at once and do the business. While rapid response team, somebody will come out of the team, identify the situation and start calling for help. Depends on the situation that's ongoing. So if we think about rapid response team at a nursing level and medical emergency team at physician level for cases of postpartum hemorrhage in the institution, that may help the institution itself and maybe even help regionally the institution that are beside. Because if we think practically, for example, in National Guard, we have all specialties. We can call everybody at any time, and everybody's on call. Everybody will respond. But some nearby hospitals that are few kilometers from our hospital, they don't have this luxury. They don't have as good blood banks. They don't have as good uh, availability of all specialties and maybe um, the, the skills to manage. So if we think widely in doing that and creating that team, which I uh, have been uh, proven in the literature by several authors that has been introduced in their setups and even in developed countries have resulted in reducing maternal mortality and morbidities that are resulting from postpartum hemorrhage. So if we think that we define a policy concerning the function of that team, establish that team uh, to serve institution and region even, and utilize the various experiences that has been published elsewhere in creating that team, we may help in reducing maternal mortalities and morbidities that are occurring because of lack of resources or maybe lack of experiences at the time of its occurrence. The applicability of uh, this service will be provided upon application and applicable to either emergency or even elective cases. If So in that case, in any institution, if they do have a placenta accreta or percreta, but they don't have the skills to do it, they can still keep the patient with them and that team can be activated to give them assistance at that time. Of course, there should be an activation criteria that is fixed so the team will be known and a sequence of events that should happen in case of uh, emergency activation or even uh, an elective activation so patients will be identified, treated and managed by the best skilled people that are prepared to manage these cases and the lab is ready, everybody's ready with adequate education and privileging. That has, can extend widely, can extend across the regions and even can, you can have a map to the city or the, to the area where you can map every few hospitals that can share that uh, team together. So in conclusion, Postpartum hemorrhage, hemorrhage is the major health problem contributing to maternal mortality and morbidity, and most of the cases are preventable. With active management of third stage, we are going to reduce significant number of them, and with the implementation of system that uh, can work on preventing and managing postpartum hemorrhage, also we can do further prevention of obstetric, of uh, catastrophic obstetric hemorrhage that may, may result in patient death. Thank you.